So welcome to today's Spark Your Health Talk, Rethinking Diabetes. My name is Katira Noviello Kapoor, and I'm the Senior Director of Health Promotion, Wellness, and Athletics at the 92nd Street Y. This evening, we look forward to doing a deep dive into the history and possible future of diabetes treatment, featuring award-winning journalist and writer Gary Taubes in conversation with Mount Sinai VP of Disease Management, Abby Schwartz. I would also like to thank our Spark Your Health talk series sponsor, Mount Sinai, for their support. We hope you will be able to join us for upcoming Spark Your Health events this winter, such as Going Full Frontal on Women's Health with Samantha B. and Dr. Jen Gunter on February 1st. In-person tickets for this event are sold out, but we still have live stream tickets available. We also have talks coming up on Honest Aging, The Truth and Lies of Women's Health in Medicine, Lifestyle Medicine for Breast Cancer Risk Reduction, and the Influence of Social Media on Girls and Body Image, just to name a few. We will leave 15 minutes at the end of our program for questions, which will be collected from the chat. So please feel free to just be entering your questions during um, throughout the duration of the event in the chat. And I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator this evening, Abby Schwartz. Abby Schwartz is the Vice President of the Mount Sinai Health Network and Director of Mount Sinai Fit. She is responsible for working seamlessly with physicians and certified diabetes education and care specialists throughout the health system. She helps drive value-based care and clinical outcomes for high-risk patients with a multitude of chronic health conditions, including diabetes. In her prior work at New York Market for XL Health Corporation, Abby built and launched a diabetes and heart failure condition management initiative throughout the New York metropolitan area for Medicare Advantage beneficiaries. We are excited to have her bring her wealth of experience to the conversation this evening. Abby, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Katara. I look forward to speaking tonight and now to uh, introducing and welcoming award-winning journalist and writer Gary Taubes to the virtual stage. Gary Taubes is the author of six books. He is a correspondent for science, and his writing has appeared in Discover on the cover of the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, Esquire, and numerous best of anthologies. He's received three Science and Society Awards, from the National Association of Science Writers and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Investigator Award in Health Policy and Research. Please join me in welcoming Gary Taubes this evening. Hi, Abby. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So I'd like to start off with one of the very interesting quotes from your book, that despite all the technological advances in diabetes management, diabetes remains a major problem today, and the number of those afflicted is rising. What are your thoughts on why medicine today is improving, but the numbers continue to rise of those impacted as well as those affected by the comorbid conditions related to diabetes? You know, that's the $400 billion question, isn't it? Um, the, I don't know, in order to, one of the things I think you have to do to understand diabetes today is to understand that conflict. The, the therapies we have, the drugs, the devices, the, the monitors are better than ever before in history. If you're diagnosed today with diabetes, either type 2 or type 1, you're prognosis for a healthy life is better than ever before in history. And yet uh, we're spending almost a billion dollars a day on direct costs for the diabetes epidemic. The number of uh, Americans diagnosed with diabetes has increased from 2 million roughly 60 years ago to 30 million today and another eight to 9 million don't know they have it. I mean, we're definitely in the midst of an epidemic we're making essentially no progress in curbing it. Uh, the conventional thinking is that type two diabetes is, is driven by you know uh, obesity, excess weight, and we are in the midst of an obesity epidemic as well. All my research going back now to the very late 90s has been as an investigative reporter looking at the 
sort of belief systems and nutrition and its relationship to chronic disease. And I've been very disappointed with what I found. So in effect, this book is an attempt to to show, to, to lay out the history of how we thought about not just diabetes, but its relationship to, to, to diet and drug therapy and see if there are obvious points in which we may have made mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think if those mistakes hadn't been made, we'd still probably have a diabetes epidemic, but it would be uh, much less and much easier to control. Thank you. You talk a great deal about the history of diabetes breakthroughs and treatments. What diabetes remedies from the past uh, do you see that are still being utilized today, but you feel should be and can be re-examined? Well, all of them. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the gist of it is, uh, from 1797, when the first uh, British physician named John Rollo seemed to have put a case of diabetes into remission, through the early 1900s, 1914 or 1921, depending on how you date it, the standard of care for treating this disorder was dietary. The only control we had over the symptoms was through diet. And the diet, was, and essentially the logic was this is a disease where the symptoms manifest themselves because of an in, inability to, to, to properly metabolize the carbohydrate content of the diet. So the approach was don't eat carbohydrates. And this was a standard of care in, in Germany, Italy, France, the UK, the US, every major diabetes specialist. And there weren't a lot of them because this was a very rare disease back then. But every major specialist in diabetes promoted this kind of diet. Um, once insulin therapy was developed in 1921 and first used in January 1922, the focus shifted. So now we had a drug that could control the symptoms of the disease, that could prevent patients with type 1 diet, what we now call type 1 diabetes, which was from, from uh, the, the terrible consequences of their disease in a relatively quick death, um, suddenly diet became secondary. Diet became an adjunct to drug therapy, and it has essentially stayed that way ever since. And we've come up with a whole series of rationales for why that's proper, beginning in the 1920s with the idea that, that the type 1 diabetes, which is typically diagnosed in children and adolescents, is a terrible disease. And once somebody has a diagnosis, we should allow them to live as normal life as possible. And preventing a child from having cake on his birthday is inconceivable. So we will, pardon the expression, let them eat cake and cover it with <laughs> insulin, and that'll be fine. Right. Um, by the 1930s, as insulin became a little more sophisticated, the, the idea was as the drugs got better, you could let patients consume more and more a natural diet, a carbohydrate diet. Um, by the 1960s and 70s, the, the diabetes specialists had convinced themselves that nobody wanted to go. So, and we began to fear that dietary fat was the cause of heart disease. So we should tell everyone to eat a carbohydrate rich diet, maybe particularly patients with diabetes because they're at such high risk of heart disease. And so one way I phrase it by 1971, the American Diabetes Association released guidelines in which they counseled patients with diabetes to get more than 50% of their calories from the one macronutrient they can't metabolize without drug therapy. Mm -hmm. And this was a great boon to the drug industry, not that I believe there was sort of undue influence or corruption of any kind. And the only people who ever said, wait a minute, there's another way to control blood sugar here. We can do it by diet. We're pretty much relegated to the fringes of medicine. As soon as somebody made that comment, um, they were considered not serious scientists or not serious doctors, or often it came from people who weren't doctors, but like Richard Bernstein, but who had diabetes and then became a doctor so he could be taken seriously. 
Yes. So we never got around everyone who said, look, you can control it by diet. And they might actually do better. Patients might actually do better if you let the job of blood sugar be con control be done by diet. Um, never got taken seriously until, you know, arguably the past 10 or 15 years. And in, in your experience, do you feel, um, and we'll get this to this a little bit later, but do you feel like in the medical community today, um, there is more because of the rise, um, not just of diabetes, but of also of obesity, that there is more um, attention from the physician community, paying attention to, nutri uh, to the nutritional aspects of this condition? Uh, there is, but a lot of the ten attention that's paid is then incorrect. And again, this is one of the problems with being a journalist like myself and concluding that it's almost a joke, everything you think you know about nutrition is wrong, is people get tired of hearing about all the different ways that what mm -hmm. they think they do know about nutrition is wrong and hearing it from a journalist, and I don't blame them. So, um, for instance, uh, I live out here in Oakland, California. It's our many, you know, this is the home of Kaiser Permanente, Kaiser prescribes plant-based diets to patients who are at high risk of chronic disease. And uh, the idea is that plant-based diets are uh, naturally more beneficial for us. They're, well, you don't have the ethical issues you have with animal livestock. It's better for the environment. And if people like me are right, this is the wrong prescription for maximally you know, for the, the, the for dietary therapy for diabetes. It might do no harm, but it's very likely to do no benefit. Um, there's a lot of notions about nutrition that have been propagated and that are um, treated as essentially facts uh, that one of the things I point out in my books is that when you actually go look for the evidence base behind them, there is there are a few randomized controlled trials that fail to to confirm the hypotheses and then the world of observation of the reality get into because that's another four hour conversation. So um, I think physicians are paying more attention. I think that what's often known as this sort of low carb movement or keto movement has been mm -hmm. getting a lot of um, uh, making progress because it is a dietary approach to chronic disease. It seems to do some remarkable things. But simultaneously, there's pushback from the, you know, vegan and vegetarian and plant-based diet movement, which are convinced that they're right. And of course, one of the arguments that I make is that we desperately need the research so that patients should know, you know, is there a diet that will keep that will maximize my health and ideally minimize my drug use, my pharmaceutical. It was interesting um, in the book when you, you you mentioned when you were doing some research on rats and um, how the rats, when you set up bins, when there was bins of food set up for them, that they actually gravitated to the higher fat, high protein um, foods as opposed and, and, and um, you know, in our world, I think it's, it's, we oftentimes you know, gravitate towards carbohydrates because it's it could be easy, but really um, once we start to shift away from a higher carbohydrate diet, we see it actually that that proteins and healthy fats are quite satisfying. Um, so do you feel like with the, the endocrinologists, with physicians, with registered dietitians, there is more of the shift starting to happen with um, this keto-esque diet. And can you also talk a little bit about, um, for our audience, about the, this keto diet or the, the diet that you're really talking, okay. you talk a lot about in, in your book? Well, so this is, um, and I, it's funny, my last book was called The Case for Keto, and I wish we hadn't called it that because it kind of misses the point. Um, so again, if you look at this period from 1797 to 1921, the idea was 
patients with diabetes can't metabolize carbohydrates safely, but they can live perfectly well without eating them. So the physicians prescribed what they called at the time the animal diet, which was basically fatty meat and green leafy vegetables. And you boil the green leafy vegetables three times to get all the carbohydrates out. Interestingly, it would also get all the vitamins out. So you could ask mm -hmm. the question why these people didn't suffer vitamin deficiencies, but they apparently didn't. Um, that was a very successful therapy. By the end of the 19th century, physicians were realizing that they wanted to give the patients as many calories as possible because often the patients didn't come in until one of the symptoms of, of die, that they had diabetes because they weren't getting their blood checked by their doctor every year. So they would only come in after they experienced a significant weight loss. So the Physicians wanted to build them back up, and they were telling them avoid carbohydrates. They had to eat something, and so they were telling them to eat as much fat as possible, and, and butter, and heavy cream were major aspects of these diets. And these patients could thrive on what today, you know, what from the 1970s onward would horrify any cardiologist in the world. But it was a very successful way to keep diabetic patients alive. The the diet then, like I said, with the introduction of insulin, it goes away, but it keeps coming back as a weight loss tool because these diets are very effective, no matter efficient at, at uh, allowing people to uh, achieve and maintain. In the 60s, it came back as the Atkins diet, and that was extraordinarily controversial and protein power and sugar busters. But the gist of it is, um, as a famous French writer wrote in 1825. So 199 years ago, he described this way of eating as more or less rigid abstinence from carbohydrates. Uh, he called them farinaceous foods, but that's what he meant. And if you're more or less rigidly abstaining from the sugars and starches and grains and legumes in the diet, you're getting your calories primarily from protein and fat, actually primarily from fat, but um, and over the past 20 years, and one of the first times I ever wrote about it was in this infamous New York Times Magazine cover story back in 2002. And the reason I did it is for the first time, essentially ever, a series of physicians had done randomized controlled trials to see how safe and effective these diets were. And there been five mm -hmm. trials done, they, mm -hmm. the results were consistent. In every case, people who were told to eat this Atkins diet, which allegedly was going to clog their arteries so fast, they'd have a heart attack before they even walk out of you know, the, the kitchen, um, led to greater weight loss and improvements in heart disease risk factors over the kinds of diets that the American Heart Association was, presented, was prescribing, and to some extent still prescribes. Uh, and ever since then, there's been going on 200 clinical trials done to test the safety and efficacy of these diets in a wide range of clinical conditions from, again, obesity and diabetes to there's now a movement. Um, they seem, at least anecdotally, to have a remarkable benefit for um, cognitive disorders like uh, bipolar and manic depressive, uh, schizophrenia disorder. And almost invariably they show benefit it's it's rather hard to believe even though i'm a proponent that this i i firmly believe this is a healthy way to eat um so in terms of the the diet that you're recommend that the you know the higher fat the high protein lower carbohydrate diet from your perspective, um, do you differentiate, like when you talk, you know, with the Atkins diet, you, as you just mentioned, it, it uh, promotes a lot of, you know, higher fat uh, sources of protein, meat and, you know, various kinds of um, high fat proteins in, in your, the, your research and your recommend, your uh, findings, do you, are you, is, is there more of the belief that the leaner proteins, or is that something that you're advocating today, the leaner proteins um, and also, also the healthier versions of fat, is that something that um, is being advocated now 
uh, on a greater scale? Um, the answer is I don't know because I sit in my office in Oakland and the only time I talk to people is on podcasts and Zoom calls. <laughs> um, the, let me give you a little bit of my background. So, um, I started writing about controversial science in the, in the mid 1980s with my very first book. And my first two books were about the physicists and then chemists who had discovered non existent phenomena and lived to have to, through the embarrassment of other people, explaining to them how they had screwed up. And my expertise and my obsession became good science and bad science and how mm -hmm. hard it is to get the right answer. Mm -hmm. When I was Finishing my second book, which was about this great scientific fiasco of the 1980s called Cold Fusion, some of my friends in the physics community said, if you're interested in bad science, you should look at the stuff in public health because it's terrible. And I moved into public health, and it turned out that all of the sort of rigor and meticulous skeptical approach to evidence that I had been taught by people in the physics and chemistry communities were absolutely necessary to get the right answer, were considered sort of luxuries that didn't have to be done in public health because it was too difficult and people are dying out there. By the late 90s, I moved into nutrition. I sort of stumbled into it with first a story about salt and hypertension. And I spent nine months doing an investigation for the journal Science that won one of these National Association of Science Writers, Science and Society Awards. And I interviewed some 85 researchers and bureaucrats to try and understand the evidence base behind this argument that a healthy diet is a low salt diet. We should all restrict our salt consumption. And it turned out when you actually went looking for clinical trial evidence, for experimental evidence of this belief that it didn't exist. Um, one of the founders of the evidence-based medicine, which I discuss in the epilogue, described the situation as sort of going back to expect to find that the evidence is set in concrete and realizing that it's set in jello instead. <laughs> And that was the experience I had. And in doing it, one of the worst scientists I had ever interviewed. And my second book was called Bad Science. And in it, I thought I had interviewed all the worst scientists in the world, but this guy was clearly in the bottom five. He took credit, not just for getting Americans on the low salt diet, we were told to eat to some extent still are, but on the low fat diet as well. And I launched into an investigation for the journal Science. It took a year. I interviewed, I think it was 160 odd researchers and administrators for one magazine article. This mm -hmm. two won one of these National Association of Science Writer Awards. And the conclusion was that our belief that heart disease is caused by the saturated fat content of the diet. Mm -hmm increasing LDL cholesterol and then leading to atherosclerosis had been tested in half a dozen clinical trials and had mostly failed the test. But in this world in nutrition, and the same is true of diabetes, when you spend, so in, in a normal scientific pursuit, you get a hypothesis, you test it with an experiment. If the experiment refutes the hypothesis, that's a success. And ideally, the experiments don't cost a lot. They can be done quickly. So you can go through a lot of experiments and do everything necessary to test your hypothesis. In nutrition, these experiments can cost 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars. And they can take 5, 10, 15 years to do. And refuting the hypothesis is considered a failure of the experiment, not a success. And so what happens is you have these situations where we get a hypothesis like saturated fat causes heart disease or eating too much salt makes you hypertensive. The researchers who do it start lobbying the government to fund the study, to test the hypothesis. It takes them a year or two to get the funding. It takes them a year or two to set up the study. The study then runs for five or 10 years. And maybe 15 years after they started, they found out that the hypothesis has been refuted, which is now seen by the government as a waste of money, as opposed to a successful scientific experiment. So now you spin the hypothesis or the results, so it looks like you've succeeded. So this is my long way of saying that I came out of this experience 
with very little faith that the fat content of our diet has anything to do with the risk of heart disease. And that, and I discussed this, it's funny, the Wall Street Journal gave me a, a, a very strong uh, review for rethinking diabetes and the reviewer uh, said, you know, Cal spent 35 pages just on the fat heart disease idea. And the reason I do is because I want to show you what the data says and how we came to believe this is true and why it's really not important to worry about the fat content of the diet. By far the more important thing would be to worry about the effect of the diet on insulin and blood sugar and the, all the cluster of symptoms that, that, that go, you know, we think of as metabolic syndrome, cluster of signs, I should say, not symptoms. So um, it's an uncomfortable place to be in because, again, you find yourself saying, well, no, I don't think that. And this is the problem with everyone who's advocated for these diets. We end up saying, well, no, we don't think saturated fat causes heart disease. I mean, a simple way to look at it is the French have very low levels of heart disease, as do <laughs> the Swiss, and they live on cheese. <laughs> and not only, they don't eat chicken, they eat duck, which is a fattier bird. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a little crazy. So yeah. no, I don't. Um, the, the, and when I discuss, I try to stick to what was actually done and what was tested without my biases, I hope, interfering too much. It's impossible to prevent that. We try to fight against that. Uh, the diets that are trusted are high fat diets. And technically, these, I mean, again, the, the Fad word is keto, but these are very low carbohydrate, high fat diets. And the, because the fats are coming from natural foods, they're primarily, yeah, you know, they're about a third saturated fat or maybe 40% monounsaturated, depends on which foods. And uh, the assumption is they're healthy fats, or at least nobody's ever compellingly generated evidence that they're not. So you, it, it, talking about um, science, you, you mention in the book, you write a lot about um, Richard Bernstein and, um, and his, uh, he, he, he had type one diabetes and then became an author. And then I'm sorry, he had type one diabetes and then um, became a physician. And you share a little bit about his therapeutic approach, you know, as someone who has type one diabetes um, and how his work influences those practicing in the field today. Well, this is, um, again, one of the revelations in doing this research, but you don't realize that as we're developing approaches to treating the disease and as we're thinking about what this says about the mechanisms beneath the disease, one of the things that nobody could do is actually measure the immediate response of our blood sugar to what we were eating or exercise or sleep or stress or anything else. So through the 1960s, you would test your urine for sugar regularly and the, the doctor would look at your urine test but that was all we had the, the blood could be a, the doctor could take a blood sample and send it out to the laboratory and if you guys can hear my dog i apologize um, if you can then I'll... um anyway so by the 1960s uh, the same company that makes alpha seltzer is making a device that allows you to test blood sugar from the finger prick, uh, uh, a finger prick of blood. And um, the diabetes community doesn't really think patients would ever want to do this. And they don't really want their patients to do it because um, they think if they can test their own blood for, for blood sugar levels, they won't come in to see the physician every month and then they'll get no guidance whatsoever. So Richard Bernstein is a, a He's diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he's 12 years old, 1946. He doing exactly what his doctor and the American Diabetes Association are telling him to do. He gets a physics degree at Columbia University. He goes off into the world and he's working uh, 
in business. And he, by the time he's uh, at roughly 1970s, he's about 34 years old. He's got three children. He's married to a psychiatrist. And the complications of this disease are mounting as they do in people. And his, expected, his life expectancy at this point is about 10 years. And he thinks the disease is killing him. And he want, he's got this physics engineering background. He wants to know more about it. So he um, sees in a, in a business trade magazine an advertisement for a blood sugar monitor that's being sold, basically marketed to hospital emergency rooms. Because if a patient comes in on a weekend night uh, unconscious, the doctors have to know whether he's passed out from alcohol or in a diabetic coma. So they need, and if you don't have time to take a blood sample and send it out to a laboratory, which is closed for the weekend. So Bernstein gets a hold of one of these devices. It, today's dollars, it would cost around $4,500. And he starts testing his blood sugar regularly. And over the course of a few years, he does it in stages, but he tests his blood sugar in the mornings when he wakes up and after a snack and after a meal and after exercise. So he's doing it six, eight times a day. He ends up working closely with the one of the fellows at the company that's marketing this device because they're speaking together about how it can be used. And for the first time ever, a patient is learning how his blood sugar is responding to what he's eating. And what he realizes is that the only way he can actually get pretty close to normal, healthy blood sugar Mm -hmm. but he can't do it if he eats carbohydrates. There's no way to dose his insulin properly so that he can match it to the carbohydrates he's eating. The physicists would say that the, 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 the relationship between the two is just non -linear. But he does realize if he doesn't eat these, he's fine. And he ends up with, after by the mid-70s, demonstrated that he could keep healthy levels of blood sugar. He's much healthier himself. He's no longer having hypoglycemic episodes. Some of his complications have gotten much better. And Richard Bernstein prides himself on his network. And he so prides he himself on, I'm sorry. He prides his, himself. On his ability to network. Uh -huh. And so he wants... He starts, he joins, for instance, the local chapter in Westchester of the, you know, relatively new Juvenile Diabetes Association, and he gets on the awards committee so that he can meet the diabetes specialists that they're giving awards to, in which, and New York at this point in time is a major center of diabetes research. So he meets a guy named Shelley Bleicher, who's running a diabetes program at SUNY Downstate, and he says to Bleicher, look, I can... I can keep my blood sugar <laughs> normal. And Bishop says, that's impossible. And he says, let me show you. And he goes in and he shows him the numbers and Bishop starts studying. And then he goes to, he hears a talk by a fellow, um, Anthony Sarami Rockefeller, who's developed the hemoglobin A1C test. And he calls up Sarami and he says, look, you've got this test, so show blood sugar over basically three months. I can keep my blood sugar normal and I have type 1 diabetes. And Sarami says, that's impossible. Let me connect you with my colleague, a guy named Chuck Peterson. And I think Chuck Peterson is still hopping around and working. And they, they start studying Bernstein's approach. And by 1980, they both, Bleicher and the, the Rockefeller people, hold seminars, symposium to discuss this you know, self blood sugar monitoring, which is this great new innovation that diabetes specialists had never wanted. And they're reporting from their preliminary studies that patients keep remarkable blood sugar. And among their subjects um, are uh, pregnant women with diabetes because these pregnancies very often go poorly. The, the women very often have to spend you know, the end months of their pregnancy in the hospital, and they were very uh, receptive to the idea that they could control their own blood sugar at home and not have to, you know, and have normal deliveries and healthy babies. And when they studied these women, they doing essentially Bernstein's approach. They had healthier babies and healthier pregnancies than women who did not have diabetes, who they used as a control. So all of this motivates one of the biggest studies ever done in the diabetes world, the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial. And 
the diabetes experts who organize this trial can't see it in themselves to test Bernstein's dietary approach. Remember, you can think of this as two levers to control blood sugar, drugs and diet. But if you control it by diet, it means not eating carbohydrates and replacing so was, having... Was Bernstein eating any, I mean, was he taking any insulin? Yes, he, he continued. In fact, he sort of pioneered the idea of doing um, uh, basal doses in the morning and the bolus doses before meals. That was Bernstein's advance as well. And they accepted that and that was tested in the trial insulin pumps, which had come in the late 70s, were tested in the trial. And everything was tested except the idea that if you have trouble keeping your blood sugars normal, change your diet. And the trial was seen as one of the great successes in diabetes history when it came out in the results around the 1990 the New York Times. They quote saying this was the biggest advance in since the discovery of insulin because they had demonstrated for the first time ever that patients with diabetes could prevent microvascular complications by self blood sugar monitoring and higher doses and more frequent use of insulin. But they never tested diet. And the patients in the trial also, even though they prevented these microvascular complications, they had more weight loss and more hypoglycemic episodes. And the New York Times ran a story calling it Vindication for Bernstein. And they quote Bernstein saying, yes, but my patients do much better than theirs do. And Bernstein <laughs> is still practicing, correct? In West Bernstein Chester? is turning 90 this spring and he's still it's practicing in uh, uh, Mariner. Marinette, yeah, yeah. Westchester, and and adheres to a you know a very similar diet that he is. It's safe he, to say that Richard Bernstein probably adheres to this approach better than any human being right. alive. He's, yeah. Um, so wait, with and and what you didn't share was him him going to medical school. Like when did? Oh he, yeah, yeah. Um, that, just, As he's getting these researchers to study his approach, mm -hmm. and they're publishing papers and his name is on the papers, he's also sent an article out to all the major journals, and Richard Bernstein being who he is, he still has the rejection letters he got, which he shared with me, <laughs> but uh, he decided he had to go to medical school so he could be taken seriously when he argued that this was a viable approach. He was actually taken seriously anyway. So his first book, which was written when he's still a medical student at age 47 or so, mm -hmm. um, was well-reviewed in the Journal of the American Medical Association. They said everyone involved with diabetic patients should read it. But he went back to medical school. Some of the leading diabetes specialists of the era wrote him recommendations to get him into medical school. He had to take a few courses to cover what he had missed as a physics student in Columbia 20 years earlier. And um, yeah, one became a doctor, wrote a book called, uh, you know, on his several book, multiple books on his approach. And um, I mean, for type one diabetes, it's just again, patient, physicians have always been afraid. They've always convinced themselves of these two, that nobody should go on it, nobody, will follow a diet. Um, my counter argument is that they were prescribing diets that actually accomplished something meaningful. People might stay on the diet because they would want right. to stay healthy. Um, and then that it was too dangerous mm -hmm. to restrict carbohydrates because hypoglycemic episodes might be more profound, even as so the low blood sugar people, the physicians often think that they're you're risking when you do these low uh, carbohydrate diet that you're risking low blood sugars right. levels. And there's, yeah, I discuss the evidence that you're not, and there's observational evidence, there's survey evidence, but it it's an easy thing to test with clinical trials. I do think in the next five years enough mm -hmm. uh, academic physicians have become interested in this approach. I think clinical <laughs> trials may already be done. Then the question is, are they being done right? People don't like to, right. to get 
when they're doing diet trials, you, you don't like to call up the guy who originally suggested the diet because <laughs> you think he's, he or she is too biased. Right. And right. you're not going to get, but so then they do the trial and they do it incorrectly and they say the diet failed and then whoever it was who promoted the diet said, you didn't test my diet. You tested right. some weird version of it that you thought people should eat instead. You know, one example would be doing Atkins with the with lean protein instead of fatty protein. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, is it because Atkins didn't work or because you shouldn't use the lean protein? You should have. Right. Um, you talk in the book about a company, I believe it's Vira. Verta. Verta. Can you talk about Verta? Like as we as we move into like solutions um, today with our diabetes epidemic, um, the rise of diabetes and obesity, there's obviously, you know, a lot of attention being paid to, you know, the weight loss medication, but this company, Verta that you bought up, actually, um, you know, their, their objective or their mission is, is really to promote uh, optimal diet or nutrition lifestyle to companies. Can you talk a little bit about the founders of that company and yes. um, the, the mission of this organization and is it still uh, operating? Yeah, very much so. So Verta Health is a, a San Francisco based startup. I'm looking mm -hmm. out my window at San Francisco in the distance. Uh, it was founded originally by two researchers, Steve Finney, who was at the University of California, Davis at the time, and Jeff Volek, who I think was at the University of Connecticut and then moved to Ohio, the Ohio State University. Uh, they had both studied ketogenic diets. Um, Steve Finney had been studying them since the late 70s when he got his PhD in nutrition at the, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His mentors had developed a sort of low calorie version of a ketogenic diet that had been very successful in treating weight uh, obese sub patients in the 1970s. So they basically their idea was that diabetes is extraordinarily expensive for patients and for insurers and for employers. It's I think the average uh, medical cost for a patient is twelve to sixteen thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Um and that there was a very here was a, a way to treat the disorder with diet, essentially to put it into remission or reverse it. Uh if they could keep people on the diet. And they were thinking about how to make this idea work and they met a San Francisco entrepreneur named Sammy Inkinen, who's a rather remarkable man. Sammy's from Norway. He's got movie star good looks. He got a uh, master's degree, a business degree at Stanford. He created uh, the, the um, real estate uh, website. I think it was Trulia. He made a significant amount of money uh, when that was sold. And he was a world-class triathlete probably still is knowing Sammy, and he had been diagnosed with prediabetes, despite having won his age group in the Ironman triathlon. And right. so yeah. he reached out, he read, he you know, did what people do in this world, going down the rabbit hole, you read like my book and Finney and Volek's books and some of these, the many books now, and he reached out to Finney and Volek and said, I want you to you know, train me to, I didn't put this in the book because I thought people would believe it. Um, Sammy and his wife Meredith were going to grow from San, from San Francisco to Hawaii. And they wanted to be able to prove that they could do it uh, without carbohydrates in the diet. And they asked Steve and Jeff to help them prepare and train and how to eat and they did. And in the process, they talked about this company and um, with Sammy as the CEO, they put it together and decided that in order to get people to believe that they could treat diabetes successfully by diet, in fact, get patients off their drugs and cut their medical costs significantly, they would run a clinical trial in uh, Indiana, choosing a, a remarkable uh, physician named Sarah Halbert to run the trial for them. And the book is actually dedicated to Sarah because she passed away from lung cancer a couple of years ago. 
and was sick throughout most of this period, but never talked about it and told people. Um, the clinical trial took patients in the Indiana Health Medical System and basically randomized them or gave them the option to either use the VERTA approach, which I'll describe in a second, or to use to, to go through the system and use the American Diabetes Association standard of care. And the VERTA approach is uh, telemedicine, smartphones, coaching, and kind of essentially working to get the patients to understand how to eat with uh, uh, such that they're in what Steve Finney calls nutritional ketosis. So it's, as I describe it, it's a, it's a 200 year old dietary approach communicated by a sort of 21st century technology. And the results were remarkable. Um, roughly 50% of their patients, could, uh, virtually all of their patients got off most of the drugs. Uh, the patients who are on insulin tended to get off insulin and their hemoglobin A1C dropped into the healthy levels, they had lost weight, their heart disease risk factors improved. And so roughly 50%, I forget the numbers exactly, were able to put their diabetes into remission. And this is a disorder that the American Diabetes Association defines as a, an effect of progressive chronic dis degenerative disease. The expectation is it only gets worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I may have cut this out of the book, but there's a 2017 analysis from ADA authorities saying that the biggest challenge to successful treatment was the resistance of physicians to keep adding new drugs or increase in dosages. And here's a method, a dietary method that says this is not a chronic progressive disease. In fact, it's a disease that could be put into remission merely by, you know, a not that difficult change in diet. It is extreme in that it doesn't, you're not eating <laughs> most of the calories. I mean, that the hard to describe, but um, and the, the results were remarkable. And Verda is now, uh, last time I looked, it was valued at something like $2 billion. Um, the appearance of uh, the GOP-1 agonists has thrown a wrench into all of this because you have a whole patient population now that's clamoring for new drugs that go Adobe or Zempic rather than dietary therapy. But I think at some point they will need dietary therapy, whether they use the drugs or not. So, yeah, that's that's uh, having dietary therapy together with the medication is something that that we are certainly promoting and advocating for um, at at Mount Sinai. Um, we're going to uh, thank you so much, Gary. We're going to shift to a question from the audience, um, and we're going to start with um, this question: What new innovations? do you feel have the most potential or a positive impact on diabetes moving forward? Uh, it's an interesting question because my, you know, my work and everything I do is looking at how the innovations of the past help contribute to getting us to where we are today, which is not, you know, patients not getting nearly enough uh, Good enough therapy. I, I mean, frankly, I'm hoping that that companies like Berta and there are now more of them coming up, simply can communicate this idea that, they, that these are diseases that can be well controlled by diet. Not type one diabetes will always need insulin therapy and better ways of of um, of uh, providing the insulin. I just somebody today said he read my book and told me about a, a Berkeley startup that's got pancreatic beta cells that can be inserted in the forearm um, worries me a little bit, and I'm going to have to tell them why. But, um, you know, in an ideal world, I come, I, it's so easy for us to push pharmaceutical solutions to all our medical problems. And it's a point I make in the book. You, We have a disorder that is sort of a homeostatic disruption to the entire body. There are all kinds of different chronic complications of differing severity, and then we have drugs for all of those. 
So we have drugs for the blood sugar, we have drugs for the hypertension, we have drugs for the the, the you know the, the laser therapies and uh, for the, the retinopathies and um, uh, dialysis for the kidney failure. And I think we have to go way upstream. So I don't think the answer is necessarily going to be new innovations, but better use of this 200 year old dietary intervention. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope. Um, I know that um, something that actually we we use at times for especially those individuals who like are in the pre-diabetes range, which which you said, um, uh, which was one of the founders founders of Virgo. Yeah, yeah uh, um, you know, even just putting on a CG a continuous glucose monitor for a couple really brings to light um, the impact of what we eat on our, you know, on our overall health. It's really on our, on our blood sugar levels. Uh, it's really quite interesting. Um, what well, another yeah. question, um, what kind of side effects of insulin, if any, did you find in your research that made you passionate about arguing for a more diet specific treatment? Well, there were two obvious ones. Um, and again, I discussed the history of both of these in this case, but the, the first is weight gain, yeah. uh, excess weight gain. So from the very first months of testing insulin therapy in patients, this is back in the winter of 1920, winter, spring 1922, these physicians would notice that their patients regained weight with extraordinary rapidity and often became the ones who had started out obese, went back to being obese. The, Someone became obese from the insulin therapy such that as physicians started arguing for higher and higher doses of insulin, other physicians were saying, well, no, that's crazy. Look, you're, you're publishing your patient reports and your patients are gaining 50, 60, 80 pounds in the first six months on these drugs. Um, from the 1930s to the 1960s, researchers studying fat metabolism established that insulin is well, it's one future Nobel laureate put it, the most lipogenic hormone there is. It's just one of its primary functions is inhibiting the release of fat from our fat tissue and making sure fat gets into our fat tissue as easily as possible. So one side effect of insulin therapy is excessive weight. Gain. And mm -hmm. I don't believe it can be reversed successfully just by eating less. Uh, the other obvious uh, complication or is hypoglycemic episodes. And this was, you know, I'm a science wong, uh, obsessive, clearly writing these books, and the understanding of how insulin works together with the hormone glucagon as a sort of dual hormone system. So insulin is secreted by the beta cells in the pancreas, and glucagon is secreted by the alpha cells, which are right next door. And they're pretty much the same mechanisms. And insulin tells cells in the liver to take up blood sugar and glucagon tells cells in the liver to secrete blood sugar into the bloodstream. And when insulin's elevated, it inhibits glucagon. And glucagon. It's a beautiful system. And it's all dependent on insulin being secreted from the pancreas. And when you inject insulin into the intramuscular, it's not coming from the pancreas and first stimulating the alpha cells next door and then going to the liver. Half the insulin we secrete never makes it out of the liver. Instead, it's starting in the general circulation and you have to give yourself very high doses to get the same effect that you would otherwise in the liver and in the beta, the alpha cells. So one of the uh, very brilliant um, uh, researcher from the University of Texas San Antonio named Phil Unger had worked all this out in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And the message was, in effect, it's devilishly difficult to ever give insulin therapy without causing hypoglycemic episodes. And hypoglycemic episodes are one of the, the primary phenomena that makes living with type 1 diabetes so burdensome and so scary. And 
you could do it. One way to do it, and this was Bernstein's suggestion, is you keep insulin doses as low as possible. And the only way you keep insulin doses as low as possible is by keeping the carbohydrate content of your diet as low as possible. So that's the other side effect. Um, they both seem, for the most part, unavoidable. Mm -hmm. So another question that I've actually been quite intrigued about was um, not that anyone is perfect in following their own advice, but out of simple curiosity, what sort of diet do you follow or try to in your life? Well, when I first started doing this research back in 1999, 2000, I was actually doing another story. Freelance writers often work on more, you know, multiple stories simultaneously. So I was up in Boston interviewing uh, uh, nutritionists and obesity researchers. And I was also, I went over to MIT to, to interview a guy who runs the Laboratory of Financial Engineering for a story on mathematics in the stock market. And he, we got to talk about dietary fat. He said, oh, if you're running about dietary fat, you have to try Atkins. He said his partner, his collaborator's father, lost 200 pounds on Atkins, and he was it is Asian American. He said he lost 40 pounds, essentially giving up white rice. So I went back to Los Angeles, where I was living at the time, and I tried Atkins, and you know. And, I didn't have any children at the time. I wasn't married. The only one who would miss me if I passed away was my cat. So I wasn't worried about getting heart disease. And uh, I launched into it fully with the eggs and bacon, and steaks for lunch, and, you know, entire roast chickens for dinner. And I lost 25 pounds in two and a half months that I'd never been able to lose. And I fell off it once, but then I went back on it as I began to understand the physiological mechanisms at work. And how about now? Where where are you now in terms well, of Well the easiest way I don't eat sweets starch. I struggle with sweets. So I don't eat them in part because I have such a sweet tooth. It's I have no off switch if I eat sweets. Um I don't eat starches, I don't eat grains, I don't eat legumes. Um so I you know lunch is Salad and eat fish or poultry, and dinner is salad and green vegetables and meat fish. And I do most of the cooking for my family. We're a bit of a, a Jack Spratt and uh, his wife situation here. My wife is a mostly vegetarian. I grew up in Los Angeles, and my I want my kids to have a normal life. So I cook dinner for the family. I don't eat the starches. My wife doesn't eat the animal products. And my kids eat everything. Okay, right. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for sharing that. And um, just one last, uh, before Katera does a um, kind of a wrap up for us, just one quick question that came in through the chat was as, as, as you know, for patients, are there any uh, specific questions that you would suggest they raise with their physicians or, you know, obviously we discussed diet. Is there a, a, a great deal this evening? Any, any other areas of topics that you would suggest that patients bring forth to their physicians? Well, in all, in all honesty, one of the, the few things that made me most, this was the one book I've ever done where I was very nervous about not being a physician and not having suffering with, with diabetes myself, living with diabetes, because I simply don't have the perspective, either one of those perspectives. Um, and I've been so delighted when people who, who do live with diabetes have written to me to say how, how meaningful they found my book. Yeah. But um, I mean, the important thing to me is really to talk to them about dietary options. You know, is there a way I can control my blood sugar without taking five drugs? And if so, can you help me do it? You know, that's the, at the end of the book is basically a plea, not the patients to eat one way or the other, but for physicians to understand this thinking and to really inform themselves so they could offer their patients a choice. And if I have to do a, a minute to tell a quick story to kind of put it in perspective. Of course. So 
one of the most, this was going to be the epigraph to my book, and then the epigraph is a little quote in the beginning, but if yeah, I use it as a quote, nobody would have any reason to read the rest of the book. So one of the pe many people I interviewed was a, a, a young man who was diagnosed, he was a journalist, a chef who became a journalist, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was 36 years old, like many people who dropped into the diabetes world without any preconceptions. And he suddenly got to get up to speed and you know, full speed immediately so he can control this very, you know, dangerous disease. And his doctor explains to him that he, because he doesn't secrete enough insulin, um, he can no longer metabolize safely the carbohydrates in his diet. So they're going to tell him to eat, get about 50% of his calories from carbohydrates. He's going to eat them as, reg you know, regular amounts at every meal. And then he's going to take insulin to, to, control his blood sugar, and he says to them, wait a minute, let me get this straight. What you're telling me is that because of my disease, carbohydrates are now toxic to me, and I should, and insulin is the antidote, and so I should eat the toxin and take the antidote. <laughs> Why don't I just not eat the toxin? And it's kind of the two ways of thinking about this disease. For, for Since insulin was discovered, the idea was eat the toxin, take the antidote. The alternative hypothesis is don't eat the toxin. And we know by now, like so 200 randomized clinical trials tell us that that's a safe and effective and, and you know, benign, at worst, benign way to eat. Um, I would like physicians to understand that and health diabetes educators and endocrinologists, and that this is a, a viable approach and to understand this so much that they can then support their, present this as a possibility to the patients. Yeah. And support them and help them and give them the counsel and the guidance they need so it's not up to journalists. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And certainly in New York, I'm we're, I'm fortunate to work in an organization that does just that. So we are trying to spread the mantra uh, at Mount Sinai. So thank you so much and really appreciate all of your, you know, the, the your anecdotes from the book and your experience and especially working with some of these subject matter experts or individuals like Dr. Bernstein, who went from being an, you know, someone living with diabetes to then becoming a physician. I thought an endocrinologist, I just thought that was incredibly interesting. So thank you. And Katera, um, please share with us your, your final thoughts and Yes. No, I mean, I think that you both wrapped it up beautifully. I think that story wrapped it up beautifully. I want to thank both Gary and Abby for your time this evening. Um, I feel like it's one of those topics that's so rich, you know, we need another five hours and that still wouldn't be enough. Um, you know, we're just grazing the surface, but um, that's why, you know, definitely take a look at the book. Um, we we read it and um, I saw a few of your interviews where people were saying we needed to read it a few times just because there's so much there. Every time you read it, there's, a you know, you you, you catch something else and so, go ahead Abby. I, I think the good news here is that there is a way out of here you know a way out of this um epidemic there's definitely a way out of it and you know I, I think you know having a team that can help you uh bring you access to all the information that's needed to with, you know establish a healthy life you know establishing a nutrition plan that enables you to combat, you know, this condition, I think is, is, you know, all good news. So I, you know, that's, that's how, that's how I'm living tonight, that there is hope here. Absolutely. I think it's a very hopeful message, looking at it from a different lens as well. Yeah. So I'd like to thank you both for your time this evening. This was wonderful. Um, we'll be sending out the recording to those as well who couldn't be with us live. And I'd like to thank our sponsor for this Spark Your Health Talk series, Mount Sinai again. And please um, come back and visit us for future Spark Your Health Talks. We have a lot lined up and stay well, everyone.